Hi, so I'm reading this book right now. Actually, I just started this book, only about 50 pages in. It is Broken Genius, The Rise and Fall of William Shockley, Creator of the Electronic Age, by Joel N. Shurkin. Uh, if you don't know who William Shockley is, well, you should. I'm shocked. That was bad. I won't do that again, I promise. Uh, he, uh, along with a team of engineers at Bell Labs in the 1940s, invented the transistor. Not exactly in its modern form, but uh, it was a transistor nonetheless. Uh, if you haven't read this book yet, highly recommend it. Very good book, only 50 pages in, already really interested. Um, you really kind of have to be a history buff to be into this though. Um, it's a lot less scientific, although uh, there's definitely scientific parts to it. So I think it's one of those situations where the history buff is going to be annoyed that there's too much science. The science buff is going to be too annoyed that uh, there's history. Uh, so you got to like a little bit of each, I guess. Um, I happen to, so that works out well. So what is it that we're going to do different today in uh, celebration of reading this book? Well, I'll show you. This tiny thing here. What is it? The Humble Transistor. Yes, I figured since I'm reading about the transistor and its invention, let's talk about how uh, transistor circuits work and let's design a common emitter voltage amplifier. So we'll get right into it. Oh, and by the way, uh, this video is probably going to be long enough as it is with just the design aspect. I'm going to build this up and we'll test it, but I'm going to save that for another video, uh, probably the next video, because it'll just take too much time to try to do both in one video. Okay, I already know what you're thinking. Andrew, what does common emitter mean? How does this thing work? Where do babies come from? Well, I'm prepared to answer two-thirds of those questions and hopefully not take a semester at university to do so. All right, so why is this called common emitter? Well, that's because your input signal comes from your voltage source here, round through into the base, out through the emitter, down to ground. Remember, this is conventional current flow, not electron current flow. Don't even get me started on the differences. Uh, and your output signal comes from your power supply, down through your transistor, from the collector, down through the emitter, down to ground. So you can see that your input and your output signal are common to the emitter. So that's why it's called common emitter. Input and output signal are common to that emitter junction. Okay, so what do all of these individual parts do in the circuit? Well, out here you have your load, pretty straightforward. This is where you're sending your output signal to. Uh, your capacitors, we have one here and one here. Um, these are filters, basically. Uh, we're going to more or less ignore these in this uh, particular circuit. We're going to assume that these are perfect capacitors. They pass all the frequencies that we're interested in and they block DC. Well, the reason that these are here is because you don't want DC from the next stage coming back and you don't want DC from your previous stage coming in and messing up your bias voltage that you have on your base there. Uh, so these more or less short circuits for the frequencies we want open circuits for DC, which we don't want. Uh, down here we have another capacitor across the emitter resistor. The purpose of this one is because we have this emitter resistor here on the emitter of our transistor, uh, which all this really does is prevent the transistor from going into what's called thermal runaway. Uh, current keeps increasing, the temperature increases on the transistor, which causes more current, which causes the thing to go kablooey. Uh, we don't want that, so that's why this resistor is here. It's typically a fairly small value. Um, however, uh, AC signals could be shorted directly to ground if you put a capacitor there, but DC has to go through that resistor. So we can increase the gain of this circuit rather dramatically just by adding a capacitor across that emitter resistor 
and this acts as a short circuit to ground, shorting that emitter to ground, and it doesn't have that extra path that it has to go through. Sorry, that was a lengthy explanation, but uh, I feel that's important. We're going to assume that that's a perfect capacitor and that it passes all AC frequencies to ground. Uh, we have our collector resistor up here. The purpose of this collector resistor, remember I talked about this current flow coming down through the collector? Well, this is a current controlled current device, meaning a change in input current creates a corresponding change in output current. So, we want this to be a voltage amplifier, not a current amplifier. So how do we convert current to voltage? Well, you run that current through a resistor, and that's exactly what your collector resistor does. We can take that current across the resistor, drop it to a voltage, and as the signal changes here, more or less voltage is dropped across that resistor, and you get it out to your load. By the way, a common emitter configuration is inverting, meaning if you're smaller input signal goes like so. Your output signal will be inverted by 180 degrees and it will be larger but inverted. Sorry, that's a really bad looking sine wave. Uh, it's more like a hook. So, 180 degrees out of phase. Why is that? Well, because as more current flows here, let's say more current is flowing here, which turns the transistor on more, causing more current to flow there, what happens? you drop more voltage across that resistor. So as this signal is increasing, this signal is decreasing. So this is the element that causes the uh, common emitter configuration to invert. Uh, now what we have left is R1 and R2. These two work together to form a voltage divider and that biases our transistor because when you have a input signal say that's 0 volts, say this is 10 volts, that would be our VCC. You don't want to be down here with your signal, because guess what? We can't go lower than 0 volts. You've just eliminated all of that. Now you're only getting half your signal. You've rectified it. That's about all you've accomplished. What you need to do draw this here. You want a bias voltage and it isn't necessarily 5 volts. Um, but if you bias it up, now you can output your full waveform with minimal distortion because you're not hitting that top or bottom rail. Okay, so if there's a common emitter amplifier, surely there's a common base and common collector, and you'd be right. But I need to keep this to the point, keep the video at a reasonable length, so I'm not going to cover those today. Uh, maybe that could be a future video. Okay, so here's our procedure that we're going to follow for designing our common emitter voltage amplifier with the NPN transistor. Uh, I want to do what I call the cookbook approach, and I think probably other people call it that too. Um, we're not going to look at any of the characteristic curves, um, which is called the graphical approach. Uh, what I want to do is a step-by-step -step process for designing this amplifier. So let's get straight into it. Step one. Sorry, you know, I think people probably get annoyed by my tapping, but I can't help myself. Uh, step one. Select RE, that's the emitter resistor, and RC, the collector resistor, for desired gain and collector current. So I, I write collector current in parentheses there because I think it's really secondary to the primary goal, which is setting the actual gain of your amplifier. That's arguably the most important task of the amplifier itself. What is your gain going to be? So in order to find that, and I'll get more into it later, we are going to be taking the collector resistor divided by the emitter resistor and that equals AV. A is your symbol for gain, V means that it's voltage, but I forgot something here. Because this is an inverting amplifier, we have to write a minus sign in the beginning. That doesn't mean that we've attenuated the signal, uh, this is just a placeholder to show the uh, intended audience, 
uh, or yourself when you go to look back on it, that it's an inverting amplifier. Okay, step two, a determined quiescent collector current, ICQ. Uh, that comes from your collector and emitter resistors because as if you remember the schematic drawing that I put up earlier, it runs through both of those. That is ultimately going to determine your collector current. Quiescent, it's probably a new term for some of you. All that means is that is your idle state of the amplifier. You're not putting any input signal in, it's just sitting there, all of its DC levels found where they're going to be, and it's idling, like a car is idling. It's not speeding up or running, uh, it's just sitting there idling. So we want to find its quiescent point, what it's doing when it's sitting there idle. Uh, three, find the collector emitter voltage drop. Uh, that is that voltage drop on the output side across the transistor. Determine our bias point, V prime CCC. I'm sorry, V prime CC. Too many C's got carried away. Uh, set the base resistance, which is determined by uh, the combination of R1 and R2, which we don't know yet. So how do we do that? Well. I have a formula that I think we can uh, use as a, a good first pass to get us close to where we need to be and then we can find R1 and R2 from that. Technically we can go back and redo our base resistance calculation, but I think we're going to find that it gets us close enough. I'm not going to worry about going back and redoing it. Uh, then we determine our max output voltage swing. swing. I can't talk today. Swing. I added an H in there. Swing. It's a new thing. Here. I think we can redo that. Where's my red? Ooh, I don't have my red. Well, we'll do it in black. How about swing? Okay, there we go. I fixed it. And uh, the, your, your max output voltage swing will be determined um, by your gain and also by your VCC, which is your upper voltage, and ground. You can't go higher than VCC or ground, and arguably you can't quite get all the way to VCC or all the way to ground either. Uh, it'll start clipping before that. Uh, and when I go to the bench uh, in our next episode, uh, I'll show you what happens when uh, we start to increase that input voltage beyond what the amplifier can handle. Maybe we'll blow it up. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, ensure transistor max power dissipation isn't exceeded. Well, that's an important one. We don't want to uh, blow up our transistor, or do we? Hmm. Uh, and then, there's the last part, part that nobody likes, uh, but we'll get to that when, uh, when we get there. Okay, it's time to get into the nitty gritty. So, we don't have all of our design parameters because, well, we don't have a real world application for this. So some assumptions are gonna to have to be made. So I'm gonna arbitrarily choose a supply voltage of VCC equals 10 volts. Uh, now, next thing that we wanna do is we're working kind of right to left from that load side back towards the source. So we need to choose an arbitrary load value. So RL equals, let's just say 10. Uh, you know, let's go with 1K. Why not? One nice thing about the common emitter uh, is that it has a high input impedance and a low output impedance. So we can drive that 1K uh, on load, no problem. Uh, so what's next? How much voltage gain do we need? Well, again, let's come up with an arbitrary value, a nice round number that I like. Let's go with 10 again, makes it easy. Remember the uh, minus sign there, just to indicate that it inverts, not saying that it's actually uh, de-amplifying or uh, as we engineers say, attenuating the signal. Okay, when designing a transistor amplifier, it's best to start with the output side first, work your way back. So using this information that we have already, we need to try to figure out what our best collector and emitter resistors are going to be. Well, I s spoke earlier and said that our gain is RC over RE, the collector resistor divided by the emitter resistor. 
Um, so this can give us a ratio, so to speak, um, because we know that the gain is 10, we have a ratio of 10 to 1. So we know that our collector resistor needs to be 10 times larger than our emitter resistor. Uh, so we don't have any specific guidelines. This is for a real life scenario. Uh, so I'm just gonna wing it a little bit. Why not? Uh, I'm gonna pick a completely arbitrary value of 1K ohm for the collector resistor and 100 ohms for the emitter resistor. I've worked with these values before. I know that they work well. Um, this is gonna give us the temperature stability we need. This is gonna give us uh, you know, a good enough load on the collector to give us the output voltage we want. So let's move forward with those. All right, so I've taken our values that were over here. I moved them over to the left here to kind of get them out of the way, make sure our calculations a little bit easier. I'm gonna call this our little parking lot for uh, values. What I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate one thing at a time. We're going to go through each formula individually. And once we get that value, we'll put it over here in our parking lot. Then when we have all the values that we need, we'll go back, redraw our schematic, and we'll fill in our, uh, our final values. So the first formula that I want to go through and uh, calculate is what's called RAC. Um, so this is the resistance that the transistor is going to see on its output side in AC. Um, so basically at AC instead of DC, now this is with signals actually going through the amplifier, it sees, sees uh, a different set of components than what DC will see because you know, you've got the transistor reacts a different way uh, to AC. Capacitors certainly react a different way. Um, so what we have essentially, without going too deep into it, is RC, which is our collector resistor, this is the symbol for in parallel with. So that would be, you know, essentially, this isn't exactly what's happening. There's a little bit math, more math that goes behind it. But essentially, what that is saying, here's RC, here's RL. That symbol saying that the two are in parallel with each other. Okay. So, to find this, we need to figure out what RC in parallel with RL is. Well, we have these two values. Here's RC, 1K. There's RL, another 1K. I happen to know that the answer is 500 ohms, but let's go through really quick and calculate it. Uh, the formula for finding two resistors in parallel uh, is RC times RL over RC plus RL. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be 1K times 1K, that's 1 million, over 2, 2,000, I should say, which comes out to be 500 ohms. Uh, feel free, get your calculator out, do it yourself. I actually uh, encourage that. Uh, now, one interesting note I just want to add is if you have two values, in this instance we have two 1K, but if you have two resistors of the same value in parallel with each other, it's always going to be exactly half. If these were two 100 ohm resistors, the answer would be 50. Uh, if these were two 2000 K ohm resistors, the answer would be 1000. Um, but it's got to be the same value um, of, of both. The next thing we need to find is called you guessed it, if we just did RAC, we need to find our DC. So, our DC, what is that? That is the collector resistor plus the emitter resistor. Well, that's easy. We know that our collector resistor is 1K, our emitter resistor is 100, so 1K plus 100 equals 1.1K ohms. All right, now the calculations start to get a little bit more interesting um, because it actually starts to tell us more about how the circuit actually operates. Now we want to find the quiescent collector current, ICQ. So this is, again, this is the current that runs through the collector of the transistor at idle when it's just sitting there like a car 
and park with the engine idling. Um, so when it's sitting there not actually amplifying anything, what kind of current are we going to see flowing through that transistor uh, on the collector side? Well, we can find that by taking our VCC and dividing that by our AC plus our DC. Uh, so we have a VCC of 10 divided by our 500 ohms plus 1.1k ohms. What does that come out to? I forgot my calculator. Got it. For those of you that already calculated, wow, I'm impressed because the magic of TV, that should have been more or less instantaneous. Okay, so 10 divided by 500 plus 1100 equals 6.25 milliamps. Anyone that beat me to it and got the right answer, I am impressed. Good job. Uh, so, there we go. That's what our collector current is going to be at idle. And now we want to figure out what the voltage drop across the collector emitter junction of our transistor is, which is known as VCEQ. So that is the voltage drop across collector emitter at the quiescent point, again, the idle point. And that is our AC times, do the dot. You know, there's different ways to do it. You can do the dot, you can do the X, you can, oh, that's smudgy. Ugh, nasty. Uh, or, you know, you can do the star. Why not? We'll go that way. Uh, times ICQ. So RAC times the collector current at quiescence, which we just calculated. So that equals RAC was 500 ohms times, we're going to do it that way this time, 6.25 milliamps. And that equals, calculator again, ah, right here. 500 times 6.25 times 10 to the minus 3 equals 3.125 volts. There we go. Beautiful. So next we need to find something called RB. And this is the base resistance or bias resistance. I've heard it called both. I'm not entirely sure which it is. I probably should, shouldn't I? Yeah. Anyway, uh, to calculate this, there's different ways. I'm going to go with a tried and true rule of thumb, thumb method because, like I said, this is the cookbook method. We want to just be able to build a transistor amplifier, have it work. You know, we want this to be quick and dirty and easy. We don't want to be this, uh, have this be a drawn out process. So what is the formula for this? 0 0.1 times beta times RE. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Andrew, what the hell is beta? You didn't mention beta. What the hell is this? All right. Well, every transistor uh, in the common emitter configuration has this value beta. In fact, you'll probably find it in the data sheet. Uh, and the beta for the transistor that we're planning on using, which I haven't mentioned yet, man, I should have done that, uh, is the Q1 2N3904. Very common transistor. Um, there's also a PNP version, the 2N3906. Uh, the beta value listed in the data sheet for the 3904 from Fairchild that we're using is, I'll put it over here, beta equals 180. It's, it's a unit list number. Um, and what it is, is it's actually the ratio of the collector current to the base current. Um, and it's based on the uh, characteristic curves and all kinds of testing. It's just a unit list number. We're going to use the number 180. So, 
we've got 0 0.1 times 180 times 100 ohms equals, I was smart, I had it in my pocket this time, uh, 0 0.1 times 180 times 100 equals 1800. I probably could have done that in my head. And that is ohms. Actually, thinking about it more, that beta, yeah, it's a unitless number, but try to think of that as, say, amplification factor. The higher this number is, the better at amplifying a small signal and turning it into a large signal a transistor is. So think of it as a sensitivity, uh, a much smaller signal like that, a transistor with a large beta could really turn it into a huge signal, whereas maybe a, a medium beta or something smaller, something like that. Um, betas, I've seen them go all the way up to say 10,000 for Darlington transistors. Um, so this is actually a pretty modest one with the uh, bipolar junction transistor we're going to be using. Now we want to find what's called our VBB. That is our transistor base bias voltage. That is equal to ICQ, won't go over that again, times 1.1. Where do we get the 1.1? Well, lots of formula manipulation, rearranging of equations, KVL, uh, Tavenin voltage sources. Uh, some people say Thevenin, it's actually Tavenin. I can prove that. Uh, anyhow, 1.1 is what we end up with. Won't go into it, times RE plus 0 0.7 volts. That 0 0.7 is the base emitter voltage drop. Um, it's basically one diode drop uh, you normally have uh, across your base emitter for a bipolar junction transistor of this type. Some people say it's 0.6, some people say 0.7. I'm gonna go with 0.7. It doesn't make a huge difference. It's probably gonna work out just fine either way. And it's probably something like 0 0.63, 0 0.68, you don't know. It, it drifts anywhere between those two based on temperature, manufacturing variances. Anyhow, uh, we've got ICQ, 6.25 milliamps times 1.1 times 100 plus 0 0.7. And that equals, got the calculator again, 6.25 milliamps times 1.1 times 100 times 0 0.7 plus 0.7 and we get 1.3875 volts. Okay, now we're starting to get into the meat and potatoes of this. Finally, we get to figure out what our base resistor values are. So, let's go ahead and figure out what R1 is. Formula for that is RB over 1 minus VBB over VCC. Okay, well, let's see what that is. RB, we found 1.8K over 1 minus VBB was that long ass number. 1.3875 over our 10 volt VCC. What does that come out to be? 1800 over 1 minus 1.3875 over 10. And we come out to 2000 and nah, 2089.98. I'm just going to go with 2090. Why not? Last but not least, R2 is RB times VCC over VBB, which equals 1.8K times 10 over 1.3875, which comes out to be 1800 times 10 over 1.3875.
and we get 12.973 K ohms. Get nine a little nicer there. Sweet! We got it. Let's write that down. R2 equals 12.9, we'll just say 97 K ohms. Awesome. We have all of our values. Let's just go ahead and make a quick check here and be sure that we're not going to uh, draw more power than our transistor can handle. To figure that out, P for power equals VCEQ times ICQ, which equals, uh, where was it? 3.125. Times, that is our 6.25 milliamps. I can already see we're going to be okay, but we're going to calculate it anyway for good measure. And we come out to be 19.53 milliwatts. Well, guess what? I happen to know that the maximum power dissipation for a 3904 transistor is 350 milliwatts. We're well within that. We're good to go. So we have all of our data. We have all of our parts listed out. We know what it needs to be. We're good to go, right? No, not so fast. I don't know about you, but I have never heard of a 2090 ohm resistor, nor have I heard of a 12.97 K ohm resistor. Sure, there's values close to that. You could get some 0.1% resistors, some really high precision expensive resistors to do that, but why? Why would you do that? Uh, what we want to do is find what's called the E24 values. That's a standard 5% resistor, 5% uh, tolerance resistor. Uh, because those are easy to come by, that's what I've got in my bin here. So, uh, guess what that means? Well, we need to round for one and figure out what the closest E24 value would be. Okay, so what are the closest values? We're going to go with 2.2K for R1 here. That's ohms. R2, let's go with 13K ohms. Both E24 value resistors. 13K isn't all that common, uh, but you know, you could round down to 12K. Um, it's a little bit more common, but it happens to be really close to 13K, which is actually an E24 value. Uh, I'll have to see if I have one of those. Uh, let me check. We might end up changing that. And guess what? As expected, I don't have any 13K. Well, that's okay. We'll go with 12K, why not? Cool. All right, guess what? Now that we've changed these values for R1 and R2, that affects everything else that we just did. So now that we've finished our design and we change our values to real values that exist in the real world, now we have to go back through and redo everything as an analysis this time. Uh, I think I might go through the magic of TV and make this relatively easy. Okay, here's our final circuit. You can see I decided to go with 0.1 microfarads for both of our coupling capacitors here. That'll be plenty big enough to pass all the AC voltages we want and block the DC voltages that we don't want. Um, and down here, I left it as a question mark because I think it'll be actually more interesting to try different capacitor values, see how that affects our gain and our frequency response. Uh, so we'll certainly do that. Uh, that's it for now. Next video, we'll go through, we'll build this up on the breadboard, we'll test it on the bench, we'll see how much we can abuse it, what happens, and uh, it should be a good time. Anyway, if you like the video, make sure you click the like button, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already done so, and follow me on Twitter, at Ohms at Home. Thanks, we'll see you next time. Okay, we're moving right along. So, now that we know that our gain is 10, how do we understand... <laughs>